So who was John Cain? Intense, observant, focused, not necessarily a person who took up space, but a person who really uh, chiseled space well. I guess that's the way I would express it. I felt him moving very with clarity in that space. In order to get a sense of historical context for John Cage's performance at Dickinson College in 1970, we had current college president Dr. William Durden read the speech that opened the ceremonies during Cage's visit. And John Cage has spent his life teaching us the meaning, the fullness, and the value of every moment. His life and work in the world of musical composition and performance has been lived in present time, looking with vision and daring courage into the future. John Cage has written, quote, I am devoted to the principle of originality, not originality in the egotistic sense, but originality in the sense of doing something which is necessary to do. Joe Sobel, a prominent local musician, performed under Cage's direction during his senior year at Dickinson and actually created his own instrument for the performance. I've always been interested in cars. So it occurred to me that old car horns might make a very good instrument that uh, Mr. Cage would appreciate. And so I went through junkyards and I came up with uh, three antique automobile horns. And uh, I mounted them on a uh, two by six piece of lumber in a row. And uh, I wired up the, uh, the buttons in the series with the horns. And uh, the, uh, the moment that I remember most vividly was the moment I first hit that button and the horn went off. And it was a good bit louder than I expected. <laughs> and it, it almost stopped the concert. I mean, everybody jumped. I mean, the other performers were startled. But, uh, and, and that, uh, I think, amused uh, John Cage tremendously. Uh, so to have been able to surprise the, uh, the individual who went to such lengths to surprise the rest of them was a real challenge. And I, I felt as if I had met that. <laughs> If you approached it in a kind of dour, serious way, you weren't going to be able to make any sense of it. In order to enjoy it, you had to be open and willing to uh, get the joke. With John Cage in particular, uh, I felt as if I was in on the joke. We sat down with former college photographer Pierce Bounds to hear his take on how the audience reacted to Cage's performance in 1970. Bounds was employed to take a series of photos at pre-specified points here in the concert, a job that has left him somewhat confused to this day. My function was supposed to be to take pictures in a very specific direction at a very specific time, but it really was kind of pointless because I was shooting the film and nobody could see it for until the next day at the very earliest. So, you know, a lot of people were just sort of gawking because they didn't what was going on. I didn't know who John Cage was and I didn't know what, what we were up to in there and they would come in and just sort of stare. And, I mean, it was a room full of people doing what looked like totally random. Because we all knew exactly what we were supposed to be doing and when we were supposed to do it. But to anybody watching who didn't have the score or the script or whatever you might call it, it would look like total chaos. We spoke with Professors Beth and Truman Bullard to get an insight on Cage's compositional style from a musically technical perspective. Both professors were working in the Dickinson Music Department during Cage's visit. What Cage accomplished as a composer, in large part, could only be done once by one highly creative person. Cage's music was music without genre. That is, if each piece wrote its own parameters, the music for radios, which is simply turning on radios to different stations and mixing and matching the volume controls and these, these stations being received and creating this collage of radio sounds, uh, there's no correct and incorrect way of doing that. In fact, every time you play music for radios, obviously it's going to be different depending on what's playing on the three radios. Mm -hmm. Although radio music was not featured in Cage's performance in 1970, the piece is being performed this evening by students in Professor Blythe's first year seminar, Music Performance as a Liberal Art. We sat in one of their rehearsals as they prepared for the concert 
to observe how traditionally oriented musicians adjusted to performing in Cage's unique compositional style, and to hear what they had to say about radio music. Because radio music was written to be played on radios rather than on conventional orchestral instruments, performances of the piece have varied over the years along with changes in local radio frequencies, programming schedules, and radio technology itself. These factors have made the piece impossible to reproduce exactly, effectively stipulating that no two performances of radio music will ever sound exactly alike. Judging by Cage's overtly liberal score for the piece, the composition's lack of a precise repeatable form was not accidental. It's the strangest score I've ever seen. It's really weird. It actually takes effort to be bad. There's not a single note, there's not even a staff, or a clef. Radio music, no. I'm sorry. I don't know what I do right now. <laughs> like I said, maybe the whole effect. If maybe we were in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and somewhere like New York City, where there was actually more stations, it would sound more like music, you would hear some sort of tune to something other than static. That's, so that's not music. That, yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> numbers. <laughs> the button ones made it a lot harder. Which that is because it's completely silent and just while you're changing stations. Cage music has elicited a wide range of reactions over the years, so it is likely that each person in tonight's audience will have a vastly different opinion of radio music. However, this variety of opinions simply shows that there is no such thing as an incorrect interpretation of Cage's work. <laughs>